you basically can see what to plant so that you have a continuous bloom. So these give you the options. Um, and basically, you know, we feel that um, although some of these plants are called weeds <laughs> by some people, uh, we think they're very beautiful and they can give you the same color that the annuals give you. Um, so in the spring, you, these are good examples. Beard tongue is right now in bloom in my garden. Red columbine is now finished. Golden Alexander is finished right now, uh, but it does have a very bright, beautiful uh, flower. Uh, coming up in the summer are the butterfly weed, bee balm, and mountain mint, many other examples, but these, I just wanted to show you how you can make your garden really colorful with native plants. Um, and although this is butterfly weed, it's called weed, like is swamp milkweed and milkweed and New York iron weed. They all call weeds, but they really are very beautiful flowers. Uh, in the autumn, you can have this fall sneeze weed. It doesn't actually make you sneeze. Um, I think it was given the name because they used it for snuff, you know, to make people sneeze. Um, New England Aster again. So these are just examples I thought it would be nice to show you. Um, and now Juliet will tell you why trees are so beautiful and uh, needed. Yes, thank you. Well, when we first put this phrase up on the slide, I thought it was a little too poetic. And then I started to think about it from the vantage point of a bird or a butterfly up in the canopy. And really, it's true. It's just a statement of fact. Trees are meadows in the sky because when you look down from that perspective, you see color in the spring and you see, you see food, you see habitat uh, if you're a pollinator. And this picture is an eastern redbud. It's a really beautiful tree and you can see those lovely blooms that appear not just on the branches of the tree but also on the trunk sometimes too. And as Deepika said earlier, um, this kind of bloom provides a really, really critical source of nectar early in the season. And again, the, the list on the right is just an, it's another list that we have on our website and it's a sample list of trees and native trees and shrubs throughout the season and again the orange oh, sorry, sorry. That's right. the orange marking is the with the bloom times and then we've added here another uh, couple of tables and we say they're trees for moths and butterflies because these trees have all been ranked in terms of the or in, in the order in which they uh, attract the most moths and butterflies and you'll see on the left hand side, well, if you know Latin, you'll see that number one is oak. And I know that because it's in English on the right. The oak attracts 534 different butterfly species. And that is a huge, huge amount. So if you only had one thing that you wanted to plant, I'm not sure why you would only plant one, but if you were only allowed to plant one In fact, one that's, thing, a, that's a question we got. Oh, we did, we did, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> If you're only able to plant one thing, we would suggest planting uh, an oak tree because of that biodiversity, the extent of the biodiversity that it would support. And even though it takes a long time to grow, well, I, our understanding is that in the first five years, after the first five years, it starts to pro provide uh, a habitat for a lot of the species. So it, it's not like a 20 year plan. It's like in five years, you get the benefit of yes. it. And these are just examples of shrubs that we love. In fact, Deepika's just planted all three of these in her front garden. Um, it used to be lawn and she's ripped it up, which is wonderful. Um, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, these are service berry, winter berry and spice bush. And look at those blooms. They are just so rich and such a source of food for our pollinators. Yeah, actually, the service berry is an early um, spring bloom. Uh, spice bush is in the... I forget, it's in the in late, later. late, and yeah. winterberry is quite late too, it's in the fall. And most of these uh, shrubs also provide uh, food in the winter too, and they provide berries like yeah. the uh, winterberry, for example. Um, uh, the, the berries are a very, very important source for the food migrating. for, the, for yeah. the birds in the winter, and even the ones that are in, in the neighborhood. And if you leave your plant, it, when we talked about three season blooms, that's fine, but Winter is important too, even if you can't see color, it's very important to leave your, uh, the stalks of your plants in place because many of them are hollow 
and that provides a home for insects during the winter. They'll dig down into the, uh, the hollow stalks and even your, your leaves and yeah, any kind of organic matter on your soil is a home for somebody who's sheltering from the, the cold and the snow over the, over the winter. So very important to have a messy garden in the winter. And this slide is responsive to another question that we were asked, and it was a question about plants for dry shade, as you can see. We assumed that the shade was deep shade. Um, it's always uh, a little bit more difficult to find shade plants because most of uh, natives, most plants like sun for obviously for photosynthesis. But we put together this, this small list and we can put it on our website and we can certainly um, provide it to, um, to you. We, we'll give you our um, email information in a moment. And there are other plants that we don't actually have. I think the only one we have here is the Solomon's seal, which is the one uh, it's boring from the left with the little white uh, flowers. Right. We have that, but the others we don't have. Now, Wes is going to talk to you about where you can buy your, your natives that are free of chemicals. And uh, uh, yes, Wes, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Juliet. We have gotten a lot of questions about where people can obtain native plants when they get interested in this. They want to have some of these plants to replace sections of their lawn. And obviously you can find native plants from the Darien Pollinator Pathway. We are having a native sale on the 15th of June. And you can also get some at the Bartlett Arbor Arboretum, the Aspetuck Land Trust. And you can also go to Woodbury, which is in Connecticut here. You can go to Earth Tones Native Plant Nursery. That's what the place is called. And you can also go to a place that's a little closer. It's in Westport. It's called Gilbert Tees. And we also, if you want more information, our link, I believe, is posted below pollinatorpathway.org. And so some events and information. On April 24th, we had an Earth Day type thing. It was called Spring into Nature at the Darien Nature Center. And it was when we launched our Kiss My Grass Goodbye campaign, which is where we try to urge residents to try and take areas of their lawn and replace the area with native plants. Because as Nick was saying earlier, the grass is basically just a weed and it's horrible for pollinators and it kind of ruins the soil and makes it so that native plants can't grow there because people like to use fertilizer and pesticides in their yards. So the native plants just can't grow there anymore. So it kind of becomes a dead zone for those natives. And we are offering native plants for those participating, obviously, while our supplies last. And we also were working, we, we're still working at Stony Brook Riverbank over at Town Hall. We started on the 22nd of May, and we were working to dig up the invasive species like mugwort and the Japanese knotweed, which had completely taken over the area and Ava had talked about earlier how the native plants can kind of poison the soil and make it so, or the invasives poison the soil and make it so the natives have a tough time reclaiming the area. So the, the more we can take out, the better, obviously. And we welcome all volunteers and we have our email address at the bottom, darian at pollinatorpathway.org. And we would love the support And so here is just, we have some pictures of the riverbank at Stony Brook before we started and after we had continued working for this past few weeks. And as you can see in the picture on the left, the giant bush is just, that's just completely, that is all invasive species. That is a bunch of Japanese knotweed and there was a lot of mugwort inside as well. And there were almost no native species at all. And as you can see in the image on the right, this is after we had gone to work and we also planted some milkweed and some winterberry along the riverbank, which are native to this area. And we have cleared almost all of the Japanese knotweed and mugwort. And we're, we're obviously continuing this project. And again, we'd love for people to join us and support us. 
And so again, with more information and events on June 15th from two to six, we have our native plant sale. It is going to be at the Darien Nature Center. Last year, we weren't able to do it in person due to COVID, but this year we are able to. And we've been creating ready to plant garden kits with a variety of native species. And on the right of this slide, you can see there's sort of a visual depiction of what people can expect them to look like. Like there's a four by four foot design that you can place out by your mailbox. And there's also a five by eight foot, seven by nine, eight by 14. And you can get a range of different native species, <clears throat> which will have different requirements for sun and shade. And you can kind of integrate that into your lawn and remove some of your lawn because again, your lawn is just basically weeds and it's not good for the native plants. And we have new pollinator gardens, which are located at Tokenique School, Stony Brook, as mentioned earlier, the Darien New Store and the Bird Sanctuary at the DCA. And we have some citizen science projects with help from the Darien Library and Darien High School interns. And now I'm going to turn this over to Lauren to talk about the iNaturalist app. Thank you, Erica, first. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. That's all right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, um, Juliet, if you can stop sharing your screen, I will share mine. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the iNaturalist app, which um, was actually started as a master's project um, of a couple students at UC Berkeley, their School of Information, and then it kind of grew from that. Um, and now it's kind of a partnership between the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. And I started using it a couple of years ago because I wanted to find out what certain bugs were in my garden, as well as when I was on hikes, what the different plants were. And I'm going to share my screen to show you the desktop version, um, but the app for your phone or any other device is pretty simple. Um, so how the app works is it's basically a crowdsourcing um, way to identify plants. So you take a picture of something that you would like to identify and you want to make it kind of the central thing in your photo and as clear as possible. And then it the app will give you suggestions. And if you have absolutely no idea what it could be or your picture doesn't look like the picture that it's suggesting, you can just say it's a spider. And then other just members of the public, some with different varying backgrounds, but they are usually experts by this point, will come along and they will help you identify that. And sometimes it takes a couple of days Sometimes it never happens. I have one out of all my things that I've identified, I only have one that's never been um, ID'd, but it's a really fun activity to do, especially with um, your family. If you have kids or if you have grandkids, it's a really great way to get them engaged in the world around them and answering all those questions. I know I'm always like, what's that? What's that? And you just don't know. And guidebooks are great. Um, but sometimes they're a little limited or the picture, the one picture that they have in the guidebook might not look like what you are observing. So how do you use it? So if you don't have a smartphone or if you prefer to take pictures with a different kind of camera, you create an account, you put in your you know, email address, password, and you get this. And you can upload your observations. Now, this is not my personal account. This is the library account. So that's why there's zero observations. Um, and then you can, if you get really interested in specific things, you can break it down by species, where you've observed it. Um, let's see. And I'm just going to do more of a brief overview of you. Anybody has very specific questions, um, I will be emailing all the participants after this with 
information about pollinator pathways as well as my information from the library so you can reach out to me with those questions and I will try to help you as best as I can. Um, and the really cool thing about iNaturalist is this whole idea of projects and citizen science projects and it's a way for scientists to collect or even groups to collect data on a more massive scale than they could on their own um, and then analyze that data to understand the world um, around us. So I think, uh, was there anything else you wanted me to talk about the app or is um, Lauren going to? I think Lauren can talk a little bit after you. Perfect, okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about and can people come to you, um, come to the library if they need help downloading the app or maybe they yeah. can go to the tech center and get that? Um, so that is that area is actually, the best place to come is to the, I know it's the children's library because that's where I am. Um, I will let people at the welcome desk and everyone know um, if you have questions where to direct you, we're very friendly in the children's section, I um, promise. Um, and so that is the best place to come. Um, and we can help you download the app if you have any questions. The, if you go online as well, they have um, an amazing number of um, you know, video tutorials as well, if you want to independently look at things. Um, and then there are guidelines. Um, and people sometimes will make comments or like suggestive um, suggestions on your identifications as well. Um, I know some people have gotten tips about the best way to take photos. Um, some people will, they're really in, um, into it. They use bug nets and then it's against a white background. All of mine have been against either grass or flowers um, or mulch or something like that. And I haven't had um, an issue with identifying things. But um, yeah, it's really fun and I highly recommend it. Um, oh, last thing. <laughs> uh, I don't like using the data on my phone. So I often take pictures when I'm out and then I get back at the end of the day and then I'll upload everything on the Wi-Fi. And when you do that, you then have to select where you took the picture. So you have to kind of use the map and select the general location of where you were. If you do it on site, then it's no problem. It does it automatically. So I really hope that you guys download it and come to the library. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna pass it off to Lauren to talk more about the Pollinator Pathways specific citizen science projects that they have set up. Okay. Well, um, I'm gonna start off by talking about citizen science, which is a big part of the uh, iNaturalist app. Citizen science refers to public participation and collaboration in specific scientific research. And it basically means we can keep track and record uh, important data and contribute to scientific research. But in this case, it would be uh, biodiversity research. When we take photos or in iNaturalist, they describe it as making observations. The app shares the information with repositories of scientific data so that scientists will be able to access and analyze the information. And the idea of this is to create metrics to see how well a Darien is doing in increasing pollinator numbers, or if the efforts aren't really making much of a change. And this will help overall uh, to improve our environment. So we have three big um, projects, you could call them. Um, so, or initiatives, I'm sorry. And the first one was, is the Native Plant Project. And that's an ongoing project uh, that everyone can participate in at any time. And it's year round, you just upload the photos of the native plants in your yard or somewhere else in Darien. And um, the good thing is that the app will weed out the duplicates. So if two people post the same thing, as long as it's clear where it's taken, um, the duplicates will be weeded out on their own. And it will edit out mistakes. Like if you accidentally take a photo of a plant that's not native, they can take that out as well. Um, and this project helps form the backdrop for the two big BioBlitz events. 
and a bioblitz is an effort to record as many species as possible in a spe specified location during a specific amount of time or time period. So um, going on uh, right now is the pollinator bioblitz from May 31st to July 1st. And this event basically aims to record as many pollinators as possible in Darien um, for June. And then uh, upcoming is the moth bioblitz, which is the same thing, but it aims to record as many moths as possible during the time period of July 16th to July 26th. Um, it's important that um, we get help in doing this because the more people who join in the efforts, the better information will be. And the more information that could be provided to scientists, which means we'll get more accurate data back on what changes need to be made or whether, you know, nothing is really changed. Um, we plan on holding annual pollinator bioblitzes and uh, hopefully the result of this will be a solid database of native plants, uh, which will allow for year on year comparisons and to see how well our efforts are doing in uh, making Darien more, um, well, better for pollinators. Great, nice. Wes. Yeah, so we are welcoming anyone that would like to join us, support our cause, please help us out. We want volunteers. You can sign our pledge to go pesticide and fertilizer free. You can buy a yard sign. Please plant those natives. Join our mailing list, which we've got our email again down here, Darian at pollinatorpathway.org. And there's also our Instagram link and also the link to our website again. So please, we would love the support and we welcome anyone that is interested. And we thought we'd include a few pictures of uh, gardens that we've done around town. This one we did last year, in fact, before the virus really hit. This is at Tilly Pond Park and Parks and Rex gave us a small area of grass that we um, took up. Uh, we did a passive bed preparation, which is just really laying down cardboard and leaving it there over the winter so that the grass and the weeds were, were basically starved and died off. And the left-hand picture shows, I think that's probably early March, uh, well, no, no, later than that, sorry, probably April, May. And just basically dirt with a few very small plants. And then just in a matter of months, we had that vibrancy and that growth that you can see on the, on the right. And uh, the, my photo is slightly overexposed, but you will see color there. <laughs> and this, these are two pictures of the slopes between the town hall and the Mather Center. And the Beautification Commission took over this area and we helped them plant. Again, the left-hand picture shows the plants not too long after they were, were put in. And the right-hand picture is more or less the same area after a, a couple of months. And again, just an explosion of growth, an explosion of color, and so many pollinators in that area. And this was just one year. Um, yeah. um, normally, it takes three years for uh, perennials of any kind, native or non-native, to really take off. So first year is creep, second is, uh, no, sleep. sleep. First is sleep, sleep. then creep, sleep. then leap. So the leap hasn't yet happened because that's going to be... No, I, I think they'll just leap over the wall and <laughs> go anywhere else. Okay. And the next slide just shows actually close-ups of the plants that most of these were are at Town Hall. And you can just see every single plant's got a visitor. And it doesn't even matter that the Agastache in the middle picture is pretty much at the end of its life, but there's, there are still pollinators uh, all, all over them. It's stunning. So, you know, we can keep talking about the pollinator pathway forever, yeah. uh, but I think we should give some time to uh, the audience to ask questions. We do have some questions, Erica, that you had forwarded to us. Do you want me to read them? Do you want to read them out one at a time? I can go ahead and read them. Okay. Um, some of them have some have been answered, but um, one in particular, when they said they needed help IDing something like skull caps, for example, um, that would be, you know, the iNaturalist app would be perfect for that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and then you can ID everything in your yard. And there is an option in iNaturalist. If you know that it's a, um, what do you call it? Like cultivated or um, domestic, sometimes for animals, if you're doing animals, um, there is an option to check that off. Um, versus if you were walking in the woods and you found it, um, that will help us as well. Um, one question that was we just got from the, and everyone who's in the room, you can submit questions if you haven't submitted them before in the question and answer um, section, which somebody did. And they asked, how can we get the no pesticide sign? We partic participated in no may, no, mow may and continue to keep areas of our lawns unmowed do you guys know love that question because <laughs> we both participated in no mow may and uh it yes it's a, a little untidy and a little unusual but uh, my neighbors haven't moved yet so i'm, I'm pleased with that. and the the sign we we sell a yard sign that says this property is on the pollinator pathway and it says pesticide free underneath it we have a small sign, it's about six inches, that's $10. And then we have a larger sign, uh, uh, I think that's 10 inches or more. And the, yeah, that's, yeah. that's 10 inches. Um, I love are, the big sign. The, the signs are very nice and they're very um, uh, pastel, pastel mm -hmm. uh, colors, similar to New England's um, palette. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a sign that you could buy from Beyond Pesticides as an yes. organization, Beyond Pesticides. And they sell a very bright uh, sign that says no pesticides on, used on this lawn, on this uh, yard. So there are a few places. Um, Thank you. All right. Um, another question is, ah, can you repeat how to get the iNatural step? Yes, sorry. Um, if you go, if you have an iPhone, you go to the app store and you download it there. And if you have a um, Android, you go to whatever your equivalent app store is and download it there as well. And then you create your account. Um, and I can, or if you just want to use their the browser, you can just go to inaturalist.org and um, you can create an account there. All right, um, let's see. next question was, how do you get rid of poison ivy and the like without harming your plants and pollinators? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> uh, I have quite a bit of poison ivy in, the, in my backyard and I usually am very aware of where it's coming out. So I try to get it before it gets too big or the roots go too deep. Uh, and typically what I do is I wear gloves and then I put a New York Times bag over my arm and then I pull it out from the roots and then I cover it up. And then I tie a knot on it and let it bake in, this, in the sun. And then I don't throw it into compost or anything. I put it into the garbage, into the trash. So it gets incinerated. So that's, you know, that's good for um, small amounts. I think it works quite well, you know, I. I the thing is poison ivy is actually a native plant and in the winter it produces berries that the birds love. Um, but yeah, but it, but people, we are allergic to it. Most of us are allergic to it. And so it's better to get it out. You have to be aware of where, um, where it's growing. And usually if it's in an area that I'm not going to go to, I don't bother about it. But if I'm going to be working in the area, I pull it out. Um, another way to take care of it, uh, if it's still quite tender, is to use a high concentration vinegar. So I had one that was kind of growing along a tree. So I kind of sprayed it with this uh, heavy, uh, high concentration being about 20% of the uh, citric acid or whatever is in vinegar. And that, that does um, get rid of it. Um, but the best solution, if you have a huge area and lots of poison ivy, is to get a few goats. It's in uh, New York City on Riverside Park. We were walking along it. And we saw that they'd cordoned off an area where they were clearing the brush and they had about three goats there. And they had a sign there that the goats are clearing the area. But they're very effective. And I, one farmer once told me that as a child, he drank goat's milk and he stopped getting the, uh, the allergy from poison ivy. 
So. As someone who's gotten poison ivy horribly many, many times, um, I think I might try that. <laughs> Well, also, there are goats at Owen Park as well in New Canaan, um, so it's, it's fun to go visit see what they're doing, and we we are sort of pushing that idea in town. So <laughs> We did talk to Jamie Stevenson yeah, about she's buying very, goats for the town. Municipal goats. Yes, she's, yes, municipal goats. They look different from normal goats. Um, <laughs> they, they, we, they got a hat. We're working on that. Yeah. But one so, thing actually did um, raise when she was describing um, how she ties the bag with the poison ivy and, and, and lets it die, and disposes in the trash. I mean, normally we are very, uh, we're very into composting and we wouldn't normally put any kind of organic matter into the trash, but it's very, um, if you're dealing with invasives, and I, it, it, it's, this is tricky because we don't feel poison ivy isn't invasive, but with invasive, you have to be very careful how you dispose of them because you can disperse the seeds even more widely. Uh, if you put them in your compost, you'll be spreading them all over your garden. Um, so we, I think we have some um, tips on our website as to, you know, optimal ways to, to dispose permanently of invasives. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, will any information be handed out regarding the upcoming Moth Week, such as like ways to observe them, et cetera? Oh, we can we do that, yeah. yes. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, if you um, email us, we can add you to our uh, mailing list, and that's darian at pollinator-pathway.org. I think I can put that in here somewhere. Thanks. You can put it in the chat, and I'll email everyone as well, yeah. um, probably tomorrow. Um, so if you join our mailing, we'll put you on our mailing. We don't send out too many emails. Um, we just send uh, maybe once or twice a year, and uh, or maybe three times. But if, if you do that, we will send out one for more three. Yeah. Great. Uh, another question is, um, are there, which native plants are deer resistant? Oh, yes. Well, we, um, the, the one that we always think of as being deer resistant is the mountain mint. So any kind of type of mountain mint, for some reason they really don't like it. But the other day I, I thought that we must've got it wrong. I, I called Deepika from Tilly and I said, something's eaten the mountain mint. And I sent her a photograph. She said, well, it looks to me like it's been cut. And I said, oh, yes, I cut it. So we know. We've, we've now proved. <laughs> so deer, deer don't like anything that has a smell. Yes, yeah. Um, but if they're hungry, they'll eat anything. That's but thing, in yeah. my garden, I've found that um, the milkweed uh, family doesn't get eaten. The, the ironweed family doesn't get eaten. Um, Pensamon digitalis doesn't get eaten. Bergamot. Bergamot, and yeah. yeah, so there are a lot of plants that don't get eaten. There's also a list of the 15 most deer resistant plants on the Audubon website. So if you just type in your, your question on that website, you'll get the 15 most deer resistant. It, the funny thing is they don't list mountain mint, but we can almost guarantee that one. Erica, we can send you that link. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, some of these are similar where it's they're asking for specific plants. Um, there's would love to know a good reference list for wet soil by a creek, light to medium shade, also has a slight soap, not yeah. soap, slope. Well, Ava just put a list together for us for Stony Brook of suitable plants for a very damp setting like that. So we haven't got that on our website yet. So we'll just edit it and we'll get it up there. And we can send that to you if you, yes, if well. you email us, you know, yep. we can send you that list. Sounds great. Um, and there are, um, there are many uh, plant lists on that website. Um, if you just look in the menu, you'll find it under either your backyard or yeah, in, there's a menu item called your backyard. Uh, under that, there is a native plant list. And there are many lists there by some Audubon, some from, um, you know, just different organizations. And um, yeah, so for different conditions. Mm -hmm. Great. And you can always email us if you have more questions about that. Yeah, we'll send you links. Um, another question, which native plants propagate rapidly? An example, like way, the way lilies spread. Okay, so in my garden, I have a, I have a fairly shady um, area, and I put this uh, meadow anemone, which uh, is a very pretty um, 
plant with a white flower, that spreads really fast. Um, so does mountain mint. Mountain mint. And the mints all spread. Yes. Yeah. In, some people think of them as bugs because they spread very fast, but I, we love them because they just fill in so quickly. And when they're growing, they send out shoots kind of overground. So you can see what's happening and you can just pull them out if you don't want them. Actually, most of the native plants I find, uh, if they like the conditions they're yeah. in, they do spread a yeah. lot. Pink tick seed is another one that is, um, is is really prolific. And we have that at the uh, slopes at Town Hall. We planted just a little bit and it's now about three foot wide, I think, which is probably one year. Great. All right. Um, I put into the chat the link to the pollinator pathway um, plant list section on the website so people can see that if you'd like. Um, let's see, we covered how to make it into the garden. Um, someone was interested specifically in which native plants support fall southern monarch migration. So for uh, all butterflies, you need a plant that's a host plant where they can lay their eggs and um, and have their young. And then they then they also need plants that provide the nectar. Um, so well, specifically you want milkweed. So milkweed, yeah. uh, all there are four or five varieties of milkweed that provide the host are a host plant for monarchs, but there are also many nectar plants. They, you know, you'll find them going to even um, you know the European butterfly, what is that? The plant, what is that plant? The butterfly. Plant. Bush, butterfly yeah. bush. They'll go to the butterfly bush for nectar. So I don't know if that's your question, but but I, you know, some plant milkweed for you know for their habitat for them to lay their eggs and for their young to eat the leaf of that that plant but and plant nectar plants for the more uh, plants that well, the more species of plants you plant, the more diverse your selection of butterflies will be. I, I yeah. think the vervain, blue vervain is the host plant for the buckeye um, butterflies. So, you know, the more you plant them, the more you're going to attract these specialist uh, pollinators. Great. All right, there's one more question. Um, and they are curious um, if there was a reason we, or you didn't mention native plants in Fairfield as a source to buy native plants. Um, I don't know them. <laughs> plants. We were being very, very purist in our list because you notice we didn't even mention our, um, our nurseries in town. We were being very specific about either organic or, um, you, you know, with absolutely no fertilizers whatsoever, no um, synthetic fertilizers. And um, I, we don't, I don't think that native is actually certified organic. So we, that's what we were sticking to. But it, it's a very narrow list that we gave. Yeah. Really because we were trying to get people to come to our plant sale. <laughs> um, let's see. Does anybody have any last questions? We have one minute before, I mean, we can stay on a couple more minutes. Um, and if you have more questions, just email us. Yeah. I promise we will uh, respond. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions about the iNaturalist app, um, just come on into the Children's Library or feel free to email me and I will email everyone tomorrow um, with some of the resources and information that we talked about.